examining her records, the heavenly court could not find a single act of charity performed by her except for a carrot she had once given to a starving beggar. So the merciful Lord decreed that she be given, she be taken up to heaven on the strength of that carrot. The angel brought back the carrot from heaven and gave it to her soul, which was leaving her body. The moment she caught hold of the carrot, it began to rise as if pulled by something invisible, lifting her up towards the sky. Then the soul of the beggar appeared. He clutched the hem of her garment and was lifted up with her. Then a third person caught hold of the beggar's foot and was lifted too. Soon there was a long line of souls being lifted up to heaven by that carrot. But the woman did not feel the weight of those people who held onto her. And since she was looking heavenward, she did not even see, see them. Higher and higher they went until they almost reached the heavenly gates. That was when the woman looked back to catch a last glimpse of, of the earth. And so this whole train of people behind her. She was indignant. She gave her imperious wave of her hand and shouted, Off of all of you, this is this carrot is mine. In making her proud gesture, she let go of the carrot. And for a moment, and down she fell with the entire line of people. There is only one cause for every evil on earth. That is, this is mine attitude. My dear brothers and sisters, in today's gospel, we encounter an important moment where Jesus engages his disciples in a discussion about greatness within the kingdom of God. The passage challenges our conventional understanding of power, status, and influence. Jesus invites us to re-examine what it truly means to be great in the eyes of God. The context of the, the conversation in the Bible is very significant. James and John, Jesus' disciples, approach him with a request. They desire the position of great in his kingdom. They desire positions of most powerful and influential figures for themselves. Within the framework of world's system, where greatness is often equated with worldly success, authority, and control, their ambition is understandable. However, Jesus' response is just the opposite to their expectations. He doesn't affirm their desire for greatness, but challenges their very understanding of what it means to be truly great. He points to the example of the world's leaders who exercise their power through domination and control. These rulers demand service and submission from their subjects. Does having someone under our control make us great? Or do we, have, do we become special if we have people waiting for our command? Jesus presents a radical, dif radically different model of leadership or greatness. He declares, whoever wants to be first must become last of all and servant of all. This statement is a reversal of worldly values. It suggests that true greatness lies not in wielding power over others, but in serving them with humility 
and selflessness. We see at another part of the Bible, Jesus using the image of a child to illustrate his point. Children are often seen as powerless and insignificant in society. Yet Jesus elevates, elevates them as models of greatness. He says, let the children come to me and do not prevent them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. This implies that kingdom of God values vulnerability, innocence, and receptivity. The contrast between worldly greatness and kingdom and the heavenly kingdom, greatness is stark. Worldly greatness is often driven by self-interest, ambition, and a desire for control. Kingdom greatness, kingdom of God greatness, on the other hand, is characterized by humility, service, and focus on the need of the others. Look at the famous rulers of the past. We can tell them, we can call them successful, but not great. We call people great if their lives are driven by kindness and love towards their fellow beings. So as we reflect on this passage, we are challenged to re-evaluate our own understanding of greatness. What is our understanding about greatness? Are we striving for worldly success and recognition? or to be great in the kingdom of heaven? Do we measure our worth based on our accomplishments and possessions, or do we find our identity in our relationship with God and in our commitment in serving others? My dear brothers and sisters, the passage challenges our conventional understanding of God, greatness. It invites us to embrace a radically different model of greatness, one that is characterized by humility, service, and a focus on the needs of others. It teaches us that following the example of Jesus, we can discover the true meaning of greatness within the kingdom of God. And practicing it in our life earns us greatness, not only in the heavenly kingdom, but also in this life. Amen.